I can't start without Ann. Where's Ann? Sorry, Doug. There's a bit of a problem. Last week while you were missing, and mm -hmm. by the way, those of you who are listening and wondering why we didn't post a podcast last week, it was Doug. He was missing. But in fairness, he did have a good reason. I don't know if we're going to talk about that today, but there was yeah. a good reason. Um, so... I ended up having uh, breakfast with Ann's husband, Steve. Good, godly man. And I'm sure he'll be watching this. Hey, Steve, how you doing? <laughs> and uh, real, um, I mean, he's an honest man, Doug. Uncomfortable having Ann part of what you're doing here. So, hey. yeah. So, she, I try to talk. Hey, Steve, come on. Doug's a good guy. I know him from seminary and, you know, all that. But. And that didn't go over well. So Anne is MIA today, probably because Steve's not letting her join us. All right. So I'll keep talking to them and, yeah, yeah. you know, and try to, you know what I'm saying? Acquired hey, things happen. Huh? What's that? I'm acquired taste. You're what? I'm an acquired taste. <laughs> All right. So let me let me set the because if Anne's watching this or we'll watch it, she'll be horrified. What? <laughs> no, there was no complaints about you, Doug. In fact, uh, they both love you as I do as well. Actually, Anne and Steve are they have some family uh, responsibilities today, so she had texted me saying, "Ah, oh, I'm not going to be able to make it." I said, "No problems. Uh, we'll miss you, but I'm sure she'll be on next week." We will miss her, and so will everybody else, but we'll, we'll look for her coming back next week. We are hoping. Because you know what? To be honest with you, Dougie, um, there's no question. She adds that, uh, what would, how would we call it, like that it factor to whatever this is, mm -hmm. because we're kind of like just bumbling fools. <laughs> would you agree with that, Dougie? <laughs> you know? I think we're so. in a little sanity and, and reality. Clarity, dignity, godliness. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so we're happy to be there today. Yeah. So we need no. you, Anne, right? We got a very dignified intro today. I think you're so gonna... I thought this was the intro. No, no, no. Are we are we rec are we recording? Yes. But we I wanted to find out where Anne was before we, we did this, but now we're ready for the intro. Okay. Hello, and welcome to The Narrow Gate. In this place, we look at the events of the day and interpret them through God's word. In his letter to the church in Ephesus, the Apostle Paul offers these words of encouragement. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What are the devil's schemes? How does he work? But most importantly, how can we stand firm against these spiritual forces of evil? So armor up and join Andrew Vixick, 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 and myself, Doug House, as we enter the narrow gate. Oh wow, Douglas, with a with a British accent. I, it was a, it was a, yeah, it was a bit of a British accent. Could you hear me? And could you hear the music? Both we heard. I'm not sure how it'll be once it's process through and eventually gets on YouTube, but I could hear you fine and definitely had that um, uh, almost dignified. dignified Queen Elizabeth type vibe going on. There. That's the theme for Masterpiece Theater. You never watched it, I'm sure. but it was In my life, no. No, yeah. no. Well, it was a pretty classy, classy uh, show. Uh huh. Um, but uh, the topic, I, did you get the topic? Hundred percent. You took us to Ephesians six. You quoted it. You already, you already started gating us right away. You took us. I to went the right to the gate in you the went right to the you gate, know, which I love. Yeah, I knew you'd like that. Love that, right? And so we're going to be talking. I presume, I assume about 
the schemes of the devil. Yes. Is that yeah. it? Yep. Um, so you mentioned last week I was not here, and, and yeah. I'm going to share the story, and it's somewhat dramatic, but it, I, I think it's very relevant um, and got me thinking and had people asking me questions that I think are good ones for us to, to ponder. So um, uh, about 10 days ago, one of my sons, my son Hayden is 21. He's got uh, a group of high school buddies. They call themselves the boys with a Z. Um, and they were, they hung together. They were pretty tight, probably six guys. Um, goofballs, fun, had a good time. Um, and one of them uh, took his own life about 10 days ago. Mm. And um, it was not totally out of the blue because this guy had struggled with some depression but it was still devastating um, for the boys, for um, the community, for his family, parents. Oh, two yeah. awesome parents. Um, and so uh, the funeral was last Tuesday. So we were able to watch it via Zoom and we, um, and we did. Um, so one of the things that, that I've been thinking about is this young man, um, who was had an incredible sense of humor and a great joy for, for life, also had a darkness that he was struggling with. Mm. And, um, and darkness, I think, is the right word. And there was even that, that in, the, in the scripture, there is a darkness of evil in the world. Yep. And so um, part of what I was thinking we could talk about is what, what role does Satan have what, what power does he have and how does he work? Because I believe that a lot of a darkness that we experience, and this is a specific example and it is fairly dramatic, but I think it can be applied to darkness we have socially, culturally, racially, all these issues that we have. There is a darkness. Yep. And, and what is that? And, and, um, and how should the Christian be processing that? Um, because we we do uh, Paul basically <laughs> was saying you got to be you got to be you got to be protected um, because there are these forces yep and they're real yep yep okay well let me do this let me open some to some prayer great topic and um, yeah let's uh, let's pray uh, Lord um, we know that you are a merciful and compassionate God. And Lord, we pray for your mercy and compassion upon the uh, parents and family members who lost uh, their beloved son. Lord, we pray for your mercy and compassion on this family. Comfort, grace, and all the help they need, Lord, during obviously this most difficult time. We also pray for Doug's son Hayden and the rest of the boys who obviously must be in shock and undoubtedly are trying to process this. Um, Lord, we pray for your mercy, grace, and comfort upon them and upon all the people who have been impacted by the passing of this young man. Lord, we, we know that, um, Jesus, you are the life and the resurrection. And that those who believe in you, even though they die, will live. And that is our hope, Lord, always, especially when it comes to dark and gloomy situations like this. You are the life and the resurrection. And for those who have trusted in you, those who have been saved by your most amazing grace, even when they die physically here on earth, regardless of the way, they are immediately home in heaven with you. And we're so grateful for that promise and again, our trust is in you and in your sovereign saving grace. And as we discuss this topic for today and 
dig into the scriptures. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher. Help us to understand the truth you inspired so that in all things Christ is exalted and all to the glory of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so you want me to transition out of that into the devil. Yeah, and, uh, and, and you know, that that's, might be, seem to be a strange topic, but uh, I certainly don't want to, I'm not exalting him at all. Of course. But we do need to have an understanding um, of what scripture says about yeah. this uh, thing that Paul says, our, uh, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world. Yep. There are rulers, authorities, and powers of darkness in yep. the world. Um, what does that mean? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's do this. Let's go first to Ephesians chapter six. And, 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 you know, Dougie, it, this is a topic that I'm sure a lot of, a lot of believers um, maybe are confused about, struggle with, and would like to have answers about. So um, I guess I can say that I'm glad that we're going through this. Certainly not glad that, you know, what the root reason is for why we're going through this. But nevertheless, I think this is going to be helpful. Let's go to Ephesians 6. And uh, in your tremendous opening, once again, that you have given to us, uh, in verses 10 and through 12, the Apostle Paul says, finally, talking to believers in the church of Ephesus, a church he had ministered to um, over a three-year period. Um, Paul was writing from Rome. He's under house arrest, his first Roman imprisonment. And he says to the believers there in Ephesus, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Again, notice, strong in the Lord, the strength of his might, which tells us we're all weak. Right? Not our might. It's his might. That's right. Put on the full armor of God. Why? So that you will be able to stand firm against what? The schemes of the devil. Wait a second. The schemes of the devil? Yeah. Paul says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against humans. It's not against your wife. It's not against your kids. It's not against your coworker. It's not against somebody who has a different shade of skin color different political affiliation. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places or spiritual realm. And so the first thing we have to understand is that as a believer, we're in a battle. Now, the first battle we're dealing with is a battle that actually is within us. We all have a sin nature. Praise God as Christians, God the Holy Spirit still lives in us. But what is Paul saying in Galatians 5? Walk by the Spirit so that you will not gratify the desires of your sin nature. For the sin nature desires that which is contrary to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit desires that which is contrary to the uh, sin nature. There's a believer's battle going on every day inside of us. Mm -hmm. So that's a battle we're dealing with. The Holy Spirit wants to lead us towards Christ-likeness. The sin nature wants to lead us towards ungodliness. It's a battle we deal with every day. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we are battling as believers in this world who are not of this world, yet still have to live in this world. We're battling with all that the world, evil world system, what the world offers us. The book of Revelation uh, talks about the harlot of Babylon, symbolic of the world's seductive system. And what the harlot is also always offering us is the cup of her immoralities, her seductiveness. And so as believers, we're not only battling with 
sin nature that is in us. We're also battling with a world system that is trying to seduce us from pursuing Christ likeness. And then number three, we're battling with forces that we can't see, with forces in a realm which we can't touch, led by the evil one, the deceiver, the father of lies, Satan. You see why Paul says put on the full armor of God? Mm -hmm. You see why Paul says be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might? I mean, to think that we, Dougie, right. on our own, with all your theological training and this, that, and that, you think you're going to win that battle? We're being assaulted on, 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 all, on all fronts, within us, around us, and in a realm we can't see, right? Right. Now, before we get depressed, <laughs> we have to understand something about Satan. Satan is not equal with God. Satan is a created being, an angel, a fallen angel. Why do I want to emphasize that? Satan is not omniscient. God is. Satan is not omnipotent. God is. Which means all powerful. Very good. And Satan is not omnipresent. God is. Omnipresent. People get confused. They think, um, I, I just talked about this in um, one of my recent sermons. When people think of omni, the God is omnipresent, they don't quite un fully understand it. Um, they kind of think that, do you, ever, do you remember that movie, Doug? Um, uh, what was it? Uh, it was called Jumper. Uh, several years back, young guy, actor, he was able to, let's say, you know, he's there in Virginia and he was able to, you know, kind of do like time and space travel and boom, jump to California. Well, the, he's not omnipresent because he he's could. not in Virginia, he's in California. And if he's in California, he ain't in Virginia. Excellent. Only God is fully present right now with you in Virginia at the same time he is fully present with me right here in South Florida. God's not like the jumper, right? So he has to jump back and forth. He is fully, he is omnipresent. And that's such a beautiful thing when you think about it as a Christian, which hopefully helps us when we are going through this battle that we realize we're not alone, right? Absolutely. Based you know, on what you said earlier, too, Paul wrote this from prison in Rome. Guess where God was? That's right. With him. Exactly. When he's writing this, it's not just, um, here's some good thoughts. I, he's probably writing to himself as much as, as, Very as good. anybody else. Very right? good. Absolutely, Doug. And again, as, as a Christian, you know, we, we need to remember that we're not alone. I mean, praise God. Because, again, when you think about what we're up against, the battle within, the battle around us, the battle in a realm we can't see, we don't stand a chance. But because God is with us, fully present with us, not distracted by all the stuff that's happening in the world, right? He's fully present with us. He is also all-powerful and all-knowing. That's why Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, right? So we have to understand that Satan is not God. And again, I think a lot of times Christians get confused with that. Um, you know, oh, Satan's always attacking me. Really? So he's just with you in your house all the time? Not he's worrying about anybody? His highest priority in the world? There you go. Uh, gang, listen to this very clearly. Satan is not intimidated by us as Christians. He's worried about Christ, right? Now, certainly Satan, 
attacks the body of Christ, right? He tried to stop the first coming of Christ. Book of Revelation talks about it in chapter 12, right? He failed. He knows that Christ is coming again. He's panicking. And that's why he's going to be calling, as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, he's going to be calling on his helpers, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and so forth. Satan does attack the church of Christ. And how does he do that? By showing up in a red cape and a horns and pitchfork and saying, I'm Satan? No. Uh, go to no, we fight that we uh, we have our arm around we go you're the obviously the enemy very good very good how does he do it second corinthians chapter 11 look at verse you're there you're quick man i didn't even have to oh, wait on wow I'm not there i'm not there yet second corinthians is 11 the... verses 13 through 15 Paul talking about these false apostles who were saying that Paul was a false apostle. Paul said, such men are false apostles. They are deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as what? An angel of light. Therefore, it's not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Though I'm not an expert on Satan, and never claim to be, don't want to be, the fact of the matter is Scripture is very clear telling us where Satan is working and how. It's in the church, and he's disguising himself as an angel of light though he is an angel of darkness. And Satan has trained his seminary students who have become ordained by Satan to be teachers and preachers. Teachers and preachers, not of sound doctrine, but of doctrine of demons. And so Satan masquerades as an angel of light. As you said, Dougie, you and I are going to get fooled if all of a sudden Satan shows up with the red cape and the horns and the pitchfork. But it's very easy for Christians to get knocked off balance by constant constant, constant false doctrine. Mm -hmm. And for non-believers who are showing up at those churches, Satan doesn't care if they believe in Jesus. He just doesn't want them to believe in the true Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. And, so it, and I think it's interesting as, as I've, thought about how Satan works and you've touched on it because you called him um, a liar and a deceiver that those are his weapons and masquerading yeah. as it is light. his weapon is deception there you go he doesn't it, he doesn't have he doesn't have the power um, you were talking about omnipotence being all powerful he he doesn't have that what he has is deception we see it in his first his first scene there you in go. this is all about deception and it's very um it's very skillful um and it's and and you, you even talk about masquerading as an angel of light in a sense the serpent is is trying is appealing to eve as a friend there you, of course i'm saving you from this closed cosmic god who doesn't want to give you your best life he is a he is a God who's holding stuff back from you. Yep. He has created you really more to control you. That's right. um, and so I I, I think um, the darkness that when we see it in Scripture and we sense it in the world. So in in my story at the beginning, this young man obviously was feeling darkness. I think the key to Satan's darkness 
is actually to darken our minds. And I think you touched on it when you yeah. talked about the real Jesus is who the father, son, and spirit really are. Yep. 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 That is the biggest darkness. Of course. Because that leads us away. And again, if God, father, son, and spirit is the source of all life, and we run from that. Yep. What is the result? Uh, of course, of if course. The source of life. What's going to happen? Death. Death. And so, so I believe that. that I, I, I. So I think that that's that darkness, and the and one of the beautiful things. And I hadn't really thought about that a lot. But then you think about. So why did Jesus come? Yeah. But and and we call him what? The light of yes. the world. There you go. He the who follows me will not walk in darkness. And he's basically saying, okay, you've been wrong about the Father forever. Mm. Even you religious people who are doing things to please him and keep him happy right. and, and, and going through all these rituals. And now God gave them those, I think, because he knew that we were so dang skittish that we wouldn't <laughs> approach him unless we actually felt like we were doing something that was worthy to approach him. Yeah. And, and Jesus said, no, I've come to show you. I've come to show you the Father. I've come to reveal the Father to you as he really is, not as how you think he is. Right. On how Satan has deceived you. Yep. And, 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 I, and I know that that's been part of my story. Um, it's part of the story of processing with people, my family and others, about the event that just took place because yep. there are questions. You said God's all-powerful and all-loving. Well, what happened? Yep. And those are... Great questions. And sure. Questions. So they're hard questions. And you said that God is omnipresent. Um, I don't know if you'll agree with me on this, but I believe he was present with this young man when he, when the young man was in that spot. And I think he understood. Yeah. And I think he, um, he was there at that moment. Well, if God was not present, then he would not be omnipresent. And, and there would be no life. I mean, if, if everything would collapse. Right. Yeah. I mean, everything would collapse. Right. Mm. So, and just a little, um, let me just add to what you said. Um, just kind of let's go off topic one second for those people who may be wondering, well, and they've heard as they've grown up, um, well, if you commit suicide, that's the unpardonable sin. And it's absolutely not. You can read about the unpartable sin in Matthew 12 that Jesus is talking about is the sin of uh, giving credit to Satan for that which the Holy Spirit clearly has done, right? That's the unpartable sin. That, that's a person whose heart is so hardened, uh, think of Pharaoh, right? That eventually Pharaoh, uh, God just judicially hardened Pharaoh's heart. It was over, right? But my point is, you know, and again, you know, as a pastor, you deal with this. Uh, you, you know, I sat in front of parents, just, you know, where's my child who committed suicide? Now, again, what I can say with, I can't say where the child is if I didn't really know the child or know the relationship the, the child had with the Lord. But, but what I can say with certainty is this. What Jesus declared at the cross right before he breathed his last breath and gave up his spirit. He said, paid in full, it is finished, to tell us that. Jesus laid down his life for the sheep, right? John chapter 10. If in fact a person who has committed suicide, yes, that is sin, right? God is the author of life. He's the one who gives us life. He's the one who has the right to take our lives, right? To say when our last moment here on earth is. We as humans don't have that right. So committing suicide is sin. But so is having a prideful thought right before you die. So is snapping at your wife right before you die. So is, think of any sin. Sure. But Jesus on the cross declared, paid in full. Meaning he paid in full for every sin that one of his sheep has committed, is committing, or will commit. Three days later, after dying, three days later, Jesus demonstrated what he declared. He rose from the dead, right? Right, we know this, Doug. We learned this in seminary, right? Where there's sin, there must be what? 
Go ahead, finish death. it. Death. Very good. Where there's no sin, there's no death. Very good. Death can't hold you. There you go, right? And so by rising from the dead, Jesus, Jesus clearly showed, demonstrated that that which he had declared on the cross, paid in full, was fact. Because if there was one sin, let's say this young man is one of God's chosen elect. That means that Christ was on the cross for that young man 2,000 years ago, and Jesus paid for absolutely everything every sin that young man had committed or would commit, including the sin of suicide. Which means if that young man was one of the Lord's sheep, where's that young man right now, Dougie? With the Lord. There you go. Well, wait a second. But he committed suicide. Paid in full. Now that's not, you know, free reign that we just run around and sin and, well, Jesus, really, really, no. But how do you explain a young man if he, you know, he had his buddies with him, raised with good parents, obviously, at least, you know, the little I know about him, but you explained, certainly understood things about the Lord, right? How, how, how do you explain, well, how do you explain when we sin? Moment of weakness, right? Now, maybe he was dealing with some real physiological, psychological challenges, maybe some chemical imbalances, which, are, which is reality. Sure. And some people, because of you know what, what they're dealing with uh, psychologically, emotionally, they don't have that kind of like... Um, uh, uh, kind of like stopgap where, okay, something wrong happens in my life before I take myself over the edge. There's this stopgap I have, right? That says, eh, maybe it's not quite as bad as you're, you're, you're thinking. Well, some people, because of real chemical imbalances, that stopgap is either not there or very weak. Sure. So maybe this young man, struggling with something what could have set him on that path towards that i don't know was it a girlfriend issue was it a school issue was it just dealing with the corona stuff watching stuff on tv the riots the the kill who knows but something set this poor man off onto that track where maybe you doug if you're get, getting upset about something you know you've got that stopgap this poor guy didn't doesn't mean if he was truly a, a regenerated believer, it doesn't mean he lost his salvation or wasn't truly saved because he committed suicide. He had a moment of weakness like we all do. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. But it's yeah. interesting. Go ahead. No, you go. Well, I was going to say like when we were in Croatia, big time Catholic country, you know, Catholic church said, well, uh, suicide, no chance. I dealt with so many people just over the, it was about two years ago, an elderly lady in our church right there calls me on the phone, hysterical. My son hung himself. Her son, father, husband, my age. Sunday cooks dinner for his family. They were out shopping or something. Sets the table. Goes into the barn. Hangs himself. He dealt with certain psychological issues because of the war. Mm. You see? Yeah. And does that make him some sort of evil? No. And praise God, one of our guys in the church had been ministering to him six to eight months in a row prior to all this. Mm -hmm. Gave him a Bible. First time the guy had a Bible, the guy was reading the scripture all the time. So again, what could I say to the mother? What could I say to her, uh, the, the father's two children and wife when I sat with them? Could I guarantee that, you know, he was in heaven? No. 
only the Lord can do that. And I explained, you know, what script Jesus says, I'm the life and the resurrection. He who dies, if he believes in me, he's alive. You offer them hope, right? Because again, think of the thief on the cross. Mm -hmm. But we went to the service that was in the small little village, little Catholic village. It was the absolute most depressing thing I'd ever seen. It was brutal. And if you would have heard what the priest said, I mean, he had nothing to offer. Oh, he was a nice guy, a good father. And it, it was bad. So well, we have a lot, we have a lot to offer because as I said, I believe that Jesus was there with that young man. And here's the other thing, because, uh, because we, we talk about that in, in the story you shared is similar, where you go, I don't understand that darkness. Yep. We know it's darkness, and we go, I just, I don't get that. Yep. Here's one thing that I know to be true, is that Jesus does get that. Good, Dougie. Jesus went to the heart yeah. of darkness by, by, by us pouring out our wrath on him. He, and so when he became by God pouring out his wrath that was reserved for us on him. Well, and by man pouring out our wrath, our wrath. It's in in one sense. There's you know uh, uh, Edwards had the sermon "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." Yeah. There's also I think a flip side is God in the hands of angry sinners mm. because we were pretty brutal. And either way, he went to the darkest place when he became sin. Anything that young man felt, any darkness he felt, Jesus could understand. Oh, imagine what our Lord endured. So, I, mind so yeah. To the point where Jesus even felt separate from God on the cross. Though never fully separate because he is, Ooh. right, yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's what I mean. So, yep. so on the cross, gee, I think, I, uh, to me, when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is so incredible because he is the Father, Son, and Spirit are one. Yep. And because of a darkness that he now is seeing the world through that is us, yep. he's now seeing God that way. And he cries out that, that he cries out. And yet he's not separated because if you read Psalm 22. That's right. Psalm 22. Very good. Turn in the middle of a psalm yep. that I think a lot of people don't get to. That's that right. Says, but you have not. You have not forsaken me. Very good, Dougie. You haven't left me. That's right. And that's the truth. And that's the truth of it. And that's the deception that Satan wants to have. Satan wants to have God. Very good. God has left you, man. And how can you blame him? Right. And how can you endure life here on earth? Take it. Why? There's no life left. That's right, Dougie. God's well, turning back on you. Let me show you. Uh, go to, uh, stay in 2 Corinthians, because you did good going to it the first time. <laughs> Second, trying to lighten the topic a little bit, because we're going heavy, right? But it's needed. It is absolutely needed, because uh, chances are, um, even though we don't believe in chances, uh, it is likely that uh, there are people listening to this who either know a loved one who committed suicide or know somebody who was committed, or maybe they themselves are thinking about it. Well, and, and I would, I would uh, agree with that and add this. Uh, the, there are young people today that are taking their lives in, in, in droves. Oh. And, and there are people, whether they're young or not, who are suffering because they feel as if, um, they are rejected by God. 100%. What we're saying yeah. is Satan is the one who has, that's his message. Yep. That's his ultimate, ultimate, ultimate deception is you, you're out. Yep. You need to realize that. And, and yeah. It breaks, our, it breaks our hearts. Yep. And and even Christians struggle with it. So I know- sure. I'm seeing you because I am you, right? Yeah. So I've been there. So when we're what we're saying here about about Jesus being there, about Jesus going to the heart of any darkness we have. Um, I, I I heard uh, 
one time, one thing is some people will go, did, did God, did, did God not care about this young man or did mm. not, God not care about the guy um, uh, who went into the barn that you were telling yeah, him? Yeah. You can't say that. No, no, no. All you have to do is look at the cross and say, I can't say he didn't care. I can right. have a lot of questions, but I can't say he didn't care. And I can't say he doesn't get it because Good. he does. Good, Dougie. Good. That's great. It's so true. And um, go to Second Corinthians 10. And I want to follow up with what you said earlier about the teenage kids. Um, Daniel and I, when was it? Two days ago, watched um, uh, um, a video. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, the Social Dilemma. It was recommended by one of the young ladies in, in our ministry. Oh, my. I don't know. You know, you, you kind of today have to almost go, well, how much of this is true, not true, whatever, because you, you just don't know. I'll leave it up to the people if they want to watch it. But it was interesting, Doug. Um, former employers, big time, uh, big time people in places like Twitter, Facebook, um, uh, Instagram, who basically were saying that the whole goal of these social media platforms is to try to change your behavior, your way of thinking to persuade you towards actions they want you to be persuaded to. And uh, I mean, it, it was really disturbing, right? And, um, but one of the things that without question was the most disturbing is what you had just said earlier. They, they showed a statistic of teenagers how since 2009 i think 10 11 since social media these platforms have really started to do their thing the teen suicide rate has exploded mm -hmm. you know because Maybe I don't have enough followers. Somebody didn't like what I posted, a picture of me. And, you know, they're, they're, you, know you think about it at that age, these precious children, they're, they're fragile when it comes to a lot of their identity, like we were, because you're just trying to figure out life. And, who, and when, you know, it's one thing when we were teenagers, and somebody said something negative to us or a couple people did. Oh, I saw you strike out at the game. Ha, ha, ha. That's hard. And that hurts. Yep. Well, imagine thousands of people. I can't. I can't. I could be, I've had conversations like this with people with teenagers. Uh -huh. We cannot, we cannot relate that to what they go through. We think they can. Gosh, I grew up. I got through it. I had hard times. It's totally Very different, different Dougie. Because, because you, you hit, it's identity. Yeah. Um, you know, as you were talking, I'm thinking, God designs it so he goes, I'm going to put you in a family. And so you're going to get this identity. Absolutely, from Doug. Yeah. But here's the problem. When everybody in the family is doing this at the dinner table. It, and it's broken by that. And then God says, I want your identity to be in me. Yes. I want you to just trust in me, but Satan, the deceiver comes in and goes, you can find a different way. And so, so, so kids like I would, because this is a human thing, not a millennial thing or right. whatever you want to call it. It's saying, I'm going to find ways to, to build my identity up. And so the phone uh, and, and all those things are it. And it's yes. absolutely devastating. And we can't, I can't understand it. I can't relate to it. I can't say, I was just like you. And so I think we as adults need to understand it's a different world and their brains even work different than ours do. Ours and work better, but they've been wounded by deception. Doug, and they're addicted. It's an addiction. Well, These and we're, we're addicted too. a lot of us as adults. Yeah. Well, we're, I tell you what, I know my personality. That's why I'm not on all that stuff because I know I, I would, I have that type of personality. I latch onto something. I'm on it, you know? Um, this is the only addiction I want to have. That's it. Because I, I'm afraid. Um, so back to that. Um, 
you, you've got to watch that. I mean, it's very, you go, oh, wow. But it really ties into what I wanted to share in this passage right here. In chapter 10, uh, against the Apostle Paul, talking to the Christians in Corinth, and he says them in verse 3, for though we Christians walk in the flesh. Here, flesh, he's not referring to the sin nature. He's basically talking about the human body, right? Though we walk as humans in this flesh, in this body, look what he says. We do not war according to the flesh. Well, there's a couple of things here. You kind of go, wait a second, Paul, we're in a war? What are you talking about here? And okay, the war we're in, we're not fighting like other humans fight wars. You know, they use tanks, they use guns, they use bombs. Okay, so I'm in a war as a Christian, but I'm not warring like the rest of humanity wars. Okay, Paul, keep going. Paul says, verse four, the weapons of our warfare. Now he's saying we have weapons. The weapons of our warfare, again, he says, are not of the flesh. Dougie, you're not using tanks. You're not using guns. What are our weapons, Paul? Because I'm not even sure what you're talking about yet when it comes to some war I'm in. What war am I in and what weapons do I use? Paul says the weapons we use are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What does your version say? Strongholds. Strongholds, right? Well, wait a second. Now you're telling me I've got to destroy strongholds or fortresses I have a divinely powerful weapon. I'm in this war. Paul, can you explain a little more? Sure. Verse five, he says, we are destroying. Boom. What is, what is your word, what version say? Arguments. Arguments, speculations. Logosmos is the Greek word. Ideologies, thoughts, teachings philosophies, logosmos. What are our fortresses, end of verse four, or strongholds? Logosmos, speculations, ideas. I don't know. Sounds like the place where social media breeds it's, all this. <laughs> sharing. Yeah. And what kind of logosmos are we talking about? Every lofty thing or thought raised up against the knowledge of God. Look, look, look. All the logosmos, thoughts, speculations, ideas, philosophy that say, ah, we know better than God does in his truth. Where did that start? Let me think. Um, I think Satan first said, did God really, really say? There you go. Logosmos. Logosmos against God's truth. There it is, Doug. And so, again, there it is. That's what happens. And so watch how it works. Every day, you asked earlier, how does Satan really work? And we know we got our internal sin nature. Oh, that's tough to battle. We've got sinners around us, Right. Tough to battle and deal with all that, right? We live in a fallen world. Um, and the world's offering us all kinds of seductions. Well, what's Satan, well, that realm that we can't see, you know what's happening? He is just flooding logosmos at us. And here's what happens. Brick by brick by brick by brick. These false ungodly ideologies, teachings, and thoughts start to form fortresses around our brains. Actually, the Greek word for fortress, it could be fortress, it could be prison, it could be tomb. So think of this, Dougie, all these ideas flooding at us every day, flooding at us every day, flooding at us every day, that they literally put our brains in a fortress where we feel imprisoned. And if we don't get these fortresses down, our brains are going to be entombed. 
and lies. Paul says, this is the battle. It's the battle for the mind. It's a battle for truth. Mm -hmm. And who's the father of lies? Satan. Mm -hmm. He's got all his trained workers who are just out there everywhere in the world, in pulpits, in classrooms, on social media, on the TV, and just flooding us with all kinds of thoughts and speculations and philosophies to the point. You ever come home, Doug, after a long day and you walk in and Sarah says, hey, Doug, how you doing? And you, you're like a zombie. And you just sit down and she's talking. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And the only thing you do, you reach for the clicker and you're just. Well, let, let me ask you, that day that you felt like that, were you out digging ditches for 13 hours straight? Mm -mm. That why you were a zombie, exhausted? You weren't doing that, right? Mm -mm. Uh, you're probably in an air-conditioned place. You came home in an air-conditioned car to a home that's air-conditioned. Most of the day, you probably sat. Not sure you used a lot of your muscles to do stuff, and yet, <laughs> and yet you're a zombie? What was that? Lagos Moss. And Paul says, we've got a divinely powerful weapon, God's truth, the wrecking ball. And suddenly, oh, I can now see that trap, that lie. I understand that's a deception. Do you see it? Mm-hmm. And that's what Paul is saying. Let me just repeat it again. Verse three, though we walk in the flesh, i.e. human body, we do not wage war according to other humans. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful. Why? For the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations in every lofty thing or thought raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. There it is. That's our warfare, Doug. Mm -hmm. And so this young man, how is it that he went to that edge? Chances are fortresses, prison, entombed. You're not thinking straight. I think Jesus, when he started his ministry, said something like, I have come to set the captives. There it is. There it is. And so he came, he came physically to tear down strongholds. Yep. Um, and we have this, Dougie. The one weapon we need which, by the way, helps us in all three areas of our battle. Our sin nature, when the word of Christ is dwelling in your heart, you're filled with the spirit of Christ, you're walking by the spirit, and you don't fulfill the desires of your sin nature. Check. I'm winning that battle. Battle number two in this world. When Babylon the harlot starts offering her cup of seductions and immorality, well, because you're filled with truth, the truth about Christ, you want to walk by the Spirit of Christ and bring glory to Christ. You go, nah, I'm filled with the truth. I don't want your cup of seductions. And then number three, when it comes to Satan, you know, that realm, Doug, we spoke about that we can't see, we can't feel, touch, or whatever. What's he doing there? Well, I think we have an idea of what he's doing. He's just trying to erect fortresses around our brains. Because, Doug, when fortresses are around our brains, we don't see that moral minefield right there. And we step into it. Mm -hmm. And it explodes. We don't see, uh, you know, what, once the fortresses come down, we go, oh, man, that's obvious. I see that one. Why did I see it before? 
because we're walking around like blockheads. And there we are, oh, Satan's attacking me, Satan's got me. Stop already. We have the weapon we need. Use the wrecking ball. By the way, and that's the problem with Christians, right? Uh, Europe, right? Danielle and I have seen a lot of like the old European castles and fortresses. Doug, you want to talk about walls. They are so thick. I mean, think about what they had to protect, right? Sure. Well, can you imagine me going up to one of those fortresses with a rubber band and going, boom, come down? Well, it's the same thing with us as Christians. I'm going to read a verse a day to keep the devil away. Yeah, that's going to work. No, you need deep, sound doctrine. I think Paul said, you said at the opening, put on part of the armor of God? Full. Full armor, baby. You need this wrecking ball. And as a Christian, throughout the day, when you start to feel agitated, right, and frustrated and kind of off, off balance, What's going on with me? You probably got some bricks being erected. What do I do? Go in your car, open the Bible, and start crushing those fortresses. Go, go, go for a walk during lunch and, and, and put on your headsets or whatever you, you do and, and listen to a sermon. This is what we do. This is how we win the battle, by God's grace and God's word. You got me going on that one, Doug. I did. Well, that's uh, that's all the time we have for today. But 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 it. So if I were to sum up what you were, you were just saying, if Satan is the huge deceiver and the liar, he uses lies to um, convince you of something um, that isn't actually true. Right. If you have the Word of God and that's truth, and it never changes. And it doesn't change. It's not going to shift. Um, that is the way to defeat those lies, to destroy those lies. And I think Jesus, um, as you look through the Gospels, if you start thinking, what was Jesus doing during his earthly ministry, which was extremely important? He didn't mm. just come to die. Yep. That was part of it. But he came to he fulfill came all righteousness. To break down those yep. walls that both religious and irreligious people have. And Dougie, by the way, in the wilderness, when Satan came after Jesus, those three temptations, how did Jesus respond? He, um, he threw rocks at Satan, didn't he? He just went to fight. Yeah, they went at a huge battle, right? Yep. Or did yep. he say three times, it is written? It is written. Here's the truth. Here's the deception Satan has. And by the way, they all, they look good. I mean, you don't understand that these deceptions and, and lies. they look close look close they sound good right. they might even make sense in our heads it doesn't mean that they're true oh um, no and just argue with a teenager and you'll get a lot of arguments like that well listen again almost true is still a lie yeah right right exactly um well thank you uh that's that's good and again the the, the reason we picked this topic is something that happened in, our, in my world but I do think it's something that we need to be aware of, and it's a good word, um, that image of, of, of these strongholds that can be in our head. And here's the beauty of it. God's the one that breaks them down. A weapon that we have is his word. Yep. A weapon that we have is, is fellowship with other believers talking. A weapon that we have is yep. prayer. Even prayer of saying, you were saying, you know, if you find yourself getting all edgy, go, God, I know there's a stronghold here that maybe I can't see, but because by the way, it's hard for us to see the strongholds. It's similar to the plank in my eye Very good. that I don't see in myself, but I see in you. Um, God, reveal that to me. Yep. Search me, O oh Lord. That's right. Tear down this stronghold. So um, good. that's great. I'm, I'm going to pray. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for um, this time, Lord. This is a, a hard topic. It's, it's a hard discussion, and yet even as we were talking about it um, and looking and hearing from your truth, I felt, um, I felt empowered. I felt um, your presence and your truth and your goodness and your mercy. You are not unaware of the struggles that we have. In fact, Jesus, you understand them more intimately than 
anyone ever will or has. Um, because you took all our sin on you. You became sin. I don't even know what that means, Lord. Mm. Mean, Lord. But I knew, know that you understand the darkness that we are wrestling with. Lord, I thank you that you, are, you have defeated Satan. And um, the battle is still going. And we get a part in that. I pray that we will be encouraged today by what we heard. And that we will put on the full armor of God and realize that, um, that there is darkness and there is evil and that you have defeated it and overcome it. Mm. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dougie. We, Thank need, you. we need Anne. Yeah, I missed her. I missed yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully, you know, things will smooth out with Steve and you. I, I'm kidding. <laughs> hey, and you can count on my prayers, my friend, uh, as you continue to minister to your son and friends on that's a tough one dougie yep so. it is that uh, god is um god is good and and um he's working amen amen god bless you look forward to seeing you next week dougie you got it bye everyone bye bye